Revelations chapter 1. I am really determined to get this thought and get this impressed. Uh, uh, this revelation impressed in your thoughts and your minds. As we go back and we look at Psalms 139, and it says that God knew our substance before he created our frame, meaning that he created our purpose from the beginning to the end before he ever decided what body to put us in and what womb to put us in. He wrote all of those things down and he put them in a book. And too often and too many times and uh, there are too many Christians that, that have limited that substance to our time here upon this planet. We are an eternal creature. We have an eternal God. We were purposed to live for an eternity and we will. We will live for an eternity somewhere. We will either live it with God who has purposed us to be with him and he has put into us and in our character and in our makeup the talents, the giftings and those things that we would need not just to perform the job that he's called us to do in this life but for us to perform the job that he's called us to do in eternity. Now you, it's going to take some time to wrap your mind around something like that. I mean, I, I, I sit there and I think to myself, my goodness, eight million years from now, where am I going to be and uh, or whatever, where I'm going to be, I'm going to be doing something, something that God has purposed. Our God is a phenomenal, awesome God. He can take and give each one of us. There are eight billion people upon this planet. There are so many more that had lived before us. We're talking about billions of people that our God has given each one an eternity of destiny. A destiny that was for eternity and gave each one of us a plan for that length of time. And he didn't create one of us the same. Now that is an awesome God. Wrap your mind around that. I mean, if God is with us, then who can be against us? If we have that kind of a creator with us, then man, there's nothing that we can't do. I'm bound and determined to drive that in to the point that we, when we think from a biblical perspective, we stop limiting ourselves to just the plan here Yes, we've got a plan here, and we've got to find out what that plan is. But you see, when we recognize that we have an eternal plan, that gives us hope for eternity. That gives us hope when we're facing death. That gives us the courage and the strength. You know, when, when we see our loved ones passing on into the life eternal who know Jesus Christ. That they're not just going into an empty space and going into uh, uh, the end of their life, but they're stepping into the next phase in the next part of God's plan for them. But let me show you the end result. This is the end of the matter of what God has called us into. We look at Re uh, Revelations chapter 1, and as I've said many times, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave him so that he could show to his servants the things which should shortly come to pass. That word shortly means quickly, which will quickly come. Once they start happening, they will quickly come to pass. He said he sent and he signified it through his angel unto his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ to all the things that he saw. This is what you and I are called to do. Right there. You and I are called to bear witness of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ of all of the things that we've seen. Now, it's fine for us to use somebody and see what God's done in other people's lives. When you see what God's done in other people's lives, 
You're bearing witness to the things that you saw Jesus do. Some people say, well, I don't know what I'm called to do in life. Right there. That sums it all up. Bear witness to the Word of God. Test, uh, uh, the testimony of Jesus Christ should be in your life. And all the things that you have seen God do, we are supposed to tell other people. We are supposed to let it be known. He goes on to tell us, he says, blessed is those who read. Blessed are those who hear. That word hear actually means who believe, who read this word and believe this word and act upon this word or this, these prophecies. There's three blessings. The one in reading it, the other in hearing it and receiving it, believing it, and then walking in it. John goes on to tell us that he was sent this message, he was given this message that Jesus gave him this message to go to the, set, uh, the churches in Ephesus or the churches in Asia. But I want to get to this part right here. Grace and peace be unto you from he who was and is and is to come the seven spirits around the throne, Jesus Christ, the faithful witness and the firstborn from the dead and uh, the ruler of all the kings of this earth. To him be glory, the one who has washed us with his own blood, with his own blood. He loved us and washed us with his own blood. Now look at verse 6. And made us kings and priests to his Father and his God. Glory be, glory and honor be to him forever and ever. What he said in this statement right here, in this verse, is the end of a matter of every born-again Christian. This is a present state of being. This is not a future state of being. Now, did you hear me? I'm going to say that. I'm going to slow it down. I'm going to say it in, in a real simple, hibbly way to, that this is now state of being. This is where we are now. If you've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I don't care if you're struggling in some areas. I don't care if you're still stumbling uh, uh, and overcoming some things. This is a present state of being, kings and priests. Notice that there are two positions. So what is he saying? There is a, a dual authority. We're not just walking in one authority. We're walking in a dual authority. Matthew chapter 16, verse 19. I didn't give you that, but I'll just go ahead and quote it. It says, I give you the keys to the kingdom. In other words, what he is saying is, if you can get this, it's going to open up a whole lot of understanding for you. He said, what you bind upon earth shall be bound in heaven. What you loose upon earth will be loose in heaven. A dual authority. Authority here in the flesh, in the earthly realm, that represents the kingdom authority. The kingdom authority that you and I, as born-again Christians, as those who have accepted Christ Jesus as our Lord and Savior, and are in the pursuit of His will for our lives. Doesn't mean that we're fully activated in it, but it means that we are in the pursuit. Doesn't mean that you're fully proficient in any of it. It means that you have accepted, acknowledged, and have moved forward in your relationship with Christ Jesus. You have been given a earthly authority to speak to our environment from, from a, uh, a standpoint. And I, I really like the way that Bishop Bill Hammond had put it in a long time ago. He did a series called The Seven Mountains. And we've heard many speak on it. But The Seven Mountains of Authority. Mountains basically being uh, government, being education, being uh, uh, entertainment. In these arenas, you and I 
the end result of our mature state of being, whatever it is that God put in us, He purposed us to fully mature in it before we move on from this life to that life. Now, we will always be growing and maturing. We will always be. I've told you before, you know, God busted my bubble when I heard Aura Roberts at seven or 94 years old talking about God woke him up in the middle of the night and told him, I'm tired of this being in your life, Oral. You need to get this out of your life now. And I'm sitting here thinking, Lord, he's 94 years old. Why can't he just rope-a-dope it? <laughs> you know, he, you're going to be taking him home here shortly. I mean, surely, you know, you, you know, being that harsh with him, I mean, he probably led more people to you than, uh, than anybody I know. But the, the, the impression that it made upon me is, no, this never ends. But we do come to a mature state in our being, in our walk with the Lord, and regardless of who we are, God knows who we are. He knows exactly how to come down to our level. And He has created us to operate in a state of maturity so that whatever it is, we walk in the kingdom authority here in this life, meaning that when we walk into an environment, something is affected. That authority is only as strong as the authority that you walk as a priest because the priest is the spiritual authority in the heavenly realms. You saw it said, in fact, uh, read that uh, uh, first, uh, uh, first, uh, first Peter chapter 2. Uh, Chapter 2, I believe it is. 1 Peter chapter 2. Verse 9. A holy nation, his own special people. His own special people. We are his special people. We're not talking about anybody else. We're talking about those that have taken up their their. Uh, uh, rightful place as king and priest, a royal people. Jump over to Exodus chapter 19. 19, verse 5 and 6. 5 and 6, yes. Now listen to this. This is where Peter got what we just heard Peter say. Here's where Peter got it. Now listen to it. Now therefore... If you will indeed obey my voice and keep my, co my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me. A special treasure. If. There is always an if in play. Everything is conditional as it relates to the things that God has given us with the exception of salvation. We've accepted the Lord Jesus as our Savior and we are pursuing Him. Our salvation is secure. But make no mistake about it, all the things that he has given us have an if behind it. If we obey him, we can walk in the fullness of the authority as a king and walk in the authority as a priest. A priest, like I said, is the spiritual side of it where we are worshiping. The main purpose and the main job of a priest is to lead God's people in worship. I'm not talking about just singing. I'm talking about a lifestyle of holiness. He said, uh, Psalms 22, verse 9, I believe it is, said, Be ye holy, even as I am holy. This is where Peter got that. When Peter said, Be ye holy, even as he is holy. Now, we're not talking about an earthly holiness. We're talking about a spiritual holiness. And that is when we are living our lives every day as a living sacrifice. Now that authority that God has given us kicks us into the supernatural realm. It moves us beyond the earthly realm into the supernatural realm. Somebody said, has said to me many times, but just recently asked me, said, Pastor, how come, um, how come, we don't see any signs and wonders like we used to. 
in the church. I said, well, I don't know where you're looking at. I said, but I don't know about you, but I've seen signs and wonders. I've seen God do what he did uh, preserve her life and what he did for my sister's life and others' life. I said, but it is all contingent upon the spirit of expectation. If you are expecting God and believing God to do something, God will do whatever it is, as long as it's in line with his precepts for your life. And I think that that's the problem that we have. We want God to do things for us and God knowing our intentions that it is not the things that we want him to do for us is not to help us to fulfill his plan for our lives. God does love us, but make no mistake about it, he created us for him and his plan. We're created for his plan. And the only way that your life is going to play out to where you enjoy the fullness of the joy of the Lord is when we have committed our lives to his plan. And sometimes his plan isn't fun. But if we want peace in our life, that's what we have to do. Why? Because he is going to see that we are able to fulfill his plan for our lives. When we look at this authority that God has given us and we, we, uh, we think that, all right, you know, I, I know when I was young, I would think, man, alive, if I got that kind of authority, I could believe God for, for anything and I'm just believing God for some things that they were nice, but they were not in, and they were not anything uh, that was displeasing to the Lord, but they certainly wasn't in God's plan for my life. As I look back on it, you know, I wanted to be a champion uh, 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 weightlifter, and, uh, but, but those things were, were not in my life. You know, I, I, as I started building, getting built up, you know, and, and, and uh, uh, having a 17-inch waist and a 42-inch chest and 13.5% body fat and, you know, uh, muscles bulging out all over the place, my head gets big. And I'm standing in line, and I go to reach for my wallet. My thought is, just flex that muscle back there and see who's watching. And the Lord said, you got to give that up. I, tear, I figured out why, how he showed me that. He, I started tearing muscle all the time. Every time I turned around, I was ripping a muscle. And then I finally, <laughs> finally got the message. The Lord said, you can't handle this. You know, you can't handle that kind of body. <laughs> you know, you need to give it up. You know, and so, I mean, you know how we use the, well, I'm, I'm going to use this for the glory of God. I just tell the, oh, yeah, right, you know, just using it for my glory is what I was. But anyway, I gave it up. I'm still building body. It just, uh, it's just different. <laughs> but from a spiritual perspective, what we see, a lot of people disappointed, you know, when we talk about this kind of authority because they've not put it in the context and in the scope of God's plan for their lives. It says in Exodus there that Miss Peg read, we are his special people if we obey his plan for our lives. Now, obeying his plan for our lives, you know, like I said before, you know, uh, you know is not something that we... Uh, that you have to do perfectly. We don't, we are not handed a, a, a complete schematic and layout of the plan that God has for our life. We discover it as we move forward in this relationship that we have with the Lord. And many times we find ourselves like, uh, like Ruth, stumbling into Boab's field. Uh, she didn't know that she was in the perfect will of God. She just knew her mother-in-law said, you need to go out and you need to, to try to find uh, uh, this certain area. She didn't know where she was going. And the scripture says it this way. And Ruth stumbled into Boab's field and began to glean. Now, Ruth didn't know it was Boab's field. And Boab's didn't know who Ruth was. But you see, it was in God's plan and it was perfect. 
stumbling into God's plan. Why? Because her heart was right. She was pursuing. She told Naomi, she said, your God will be my God. Your family will be my family. Wherever you go, I will go. And she committed to that. And that is the commitment. That is the, the example of commitment that God has asked you and I to, to set out for him. And if we do, when we step into this, then our understanding of this authority as a king and a priest catapults us into the supernatural realm. And if we learn by faith, it is our faith that we have in what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary. You see, it's the fullness of Jesus' faith. Jesus don't have to uh, walk on faith to do, do it because he's already done it, right? His faith has manifested to fullness. We have to trust in the fullness of his faith. And we don't need a lot of faith. All we need is a mustard seed of faith to believe in the finished work of, uh, of, of Calvary, what Jesus did on Calvary. His blood is still transforming lives. Every soul that calls upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, their lives are being transformed because of that one drop of blood. Like it said in the revelations there, it said, the one who loved us and gave himself his own blood to cleanse us of our sins. That blood is still cleansing sins, still placing us in the position of authority. One of the reasons why we're not able to exercise that is we don't know. We don't know what our authority is. We don't understand the fullness of it. We have to understand his word before we can really take advantage of the authority. If we don't know what is legal spiritually and what is not legal spiritually, then the enemy's going to rob us blind. He's going to tell us, yeah, you know, uh, uh, he plays off of our conscience. You did this, so you forfeited that. No, that's only if you do not acknowledge uh, the, uh, the error of your way. The scripture says that all that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. One translation says, shall be restored. It says in Psalms 103 that God will redeem our lives from destruction if we call upon Him. As we implement this authority in our lives, we really have to understand that to do this, it's going to take courage and commitment. To walk in this authority, is going to, you're going to have to resist the devil. He has given us authority over the principalities, the powers of the air, the rulers in dark places, the spiritual host of wickedness in, heaven, in, in high places. He's given us authority of, uh, with that. But that doesn't mean that when you speak to those authorities that they're just going to stop doing what they're going to do. They are aggressive. We have to resist the devil. James said it this way. He said, resist the devil. Build your resistance to the devil. We're told in fifth chapter of uh, Peter, it says, it says that our adversary, the devil, is like a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. It says, but resist him, steadfast in the faith. The word resist means to push back. Push back against his attempts. Push back against his efforts. So when we see that the devil has crossed the line, then we stand up in the authority and we push back and say no. But that doesn't mean he's not going to still try to kill her. He continued to try to kill her. He continues to try to kill us. We have to keep pushing back and say, this is not legal. I rebuke you. I resist this spirit of death. I resist 
this spirit of disease, whatever it is. Somebody asked me, I said, well, what if you've opened up some doors? Well, that brings up another good question. If you've opened up doors, then you do have to go to God and get it right with him. Because if you've opened up some doors and you continue to open up doors to the, to the uh, 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 spiritual realm of darkness, then you're going to be affected by that. And the only way to close that door is to humble yourself before the Lord and ask him to forgive you. Say, Lord, I'm sorry. Forgive me. Now, it doesn't mean that whatever it is that you got yourself into, that it's going to clear up overnight. But I guarantee you, you continue to walk in it and push back against the efforts of the devil to pull you back in it. And I guarantee you, you will be more than an overcomer. That's what the Word says, that we're more than overcomers. We're conquerors. So if you find yourself opening up doors, then st stop. If you know that there are things that you're doing or things that uh, you're exposing yourself to that are opening up doors, then just humble yourself before the Lord and say, God, help me, forgive me, and shut that door, and then be in, uh, start immediately resisting the effects of that. Because my Bible says all that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, shall be forgiven, shall be restored. And I want to hit this before I run out of time here. I do want to take some time to pray. Go back to, uh, go back to Second Peter, or uh, First Peter. I'm sorry. First Peter, chapter two. First Peter chapter two. Or I'm sorry. Second Peter chapter one. Have my twos and ones backwards there. Peter said, By the grace and peace be multiplied unto you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ. Verse two there. It said, as his divine power has given unto us all of the things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him. This is the key. It's the knowledge of who Christ Jesus is. It goes back to what Peter told Ephesians in the first chapter. He said that I'm praying that the eyes of your understanding may be enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of Christ's calling. In other words, that you may understand with clarity why Jesus came here. Jesus came here and the ultimate goal is to declare and crown you and I king and priest. And he does that through his spirit that lives in us. Listen, to do that, we couldn't do it in the flesh. We had to be transformed into the supernatural being that, that God created when the Spirit of God entered into us. When the Spirit of God entered into you and I, we became supernatural. God took our natural state of being and put His super spirit in us. We became supernatural. And through the spirit that is in us and the guidance of that spirit, he said he will lead you into all truths, John chapter 14 through 15 and 16. He will lead us into all truths. He will guide us. It says the spirit of God will convict our hearts of love, convict our hearts of sin. And he lives in us. We are supernatural. This would mean by being a special treasure, a special person. Those that do not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior do not have that distinction. They do not have that state of being. It's only those of us that are walking in that. If we can, if we can get in our minds and, and think from a biblical perspective and have a biblical worldview of our lives, that when everything that happens to us in life, we start, stop making it about our personal physical, but immediately look into the spirit realm and say, okay, Lord, 
what is the devil trying to do here? What have I allowed him room to do? What is he illegally trying to do? And we think along those lines, then it will hold us in check. It will hold our spirit in check. And then we can declare when we take a stand on an issue and we, we resist the devil, then he has to flee. He's got to back off. We don't have any ability within ourselves. It's not our job. We've not been given the task to uh, destroy the devil. John, 3 John, uh, or 1 John chapter 3 tells us that for this cause was the Son of Man manifested. For this cause is why Jesus came here. And that is to destroy the works of the devil. That is your job and my job. That's why Jesus came here. Is to build a church and empower that church with a kingdom and a priest authority to destroy the works of the devil. If we are not in this to do God's will to bring down the forces of hell and their work, then I don't care what kind of plans you have for your life. You won't be successful. Because even when you get everything that it is you think you got, you're not going to be happy. Look at these people who have billions of dollars and they're not happy. They're committing suicide because money can't fill your life. Uh, people and things cannot bring you happiness. The scriptures tells us what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul. And that's unfortunately the epithet of many who've tried to become rich in this life. The Lord said he came if we come and to, to seek his life and to serve him that we will find our own life. He said, I didn't come to be served. I came to serve. He said, if you seek your life, you'll lose it. He said, but if you lose your life for my sake, you'll find it. That's almost, you know, it's almost like an oxymoron, isn't it? But from a biblical perspective, that's what the Lord said. I know that somebody told me, he says, you know, you, you are really big on driving people to, to understand that this is all about us doing God's will. He said, that can turn some people off. I said, well, I'm not the one turning them off. I said, if they're getting turned off, it's this that's turning them off because I didn't say it. This is what the Word said that God purposed each one of us to be a part and a piece of puzzle of his overall plan in life. When we look at that, it tells us that the things that pertain to life and godliness have everything to do with knowing Jesus Christ, knowing and having trust in what he did, and knowing what his word said. And if we know this and we study this and we uh, uh, take the responsibility, and I don't know, you know, like I said before, we're not going to have to give an account for the opportunities that we did not have. There are many opportunities out there uh, that we see, and I've said many times, you know, Lord, uh, you know, what I could do, what this church could do with a million dollars, we had a million dollars. You know, I see a lot of the, these churches and I see a lot of the, uh, the ministries who have so much. And, and, and I said, look at the opportunities they have. And I just hear, I hear the Lord say, stop looking at their opportunities and look at your opportunities. Because you're not going to give account for the opportunities you don't have. What you're going to give an account for are the opportunities that you have that you did not take advantage of. And God has given each one of us in our individual lives opportunities. Now, maybe you feel that you've been cheated, you know, or maybe you feel someone has been given better opportunities. That is not for you to say. God gave us you, our lives. God gave you your life. And it's not to us. We need to find out what he chose us for. 
It's not like he just puts us out here. And I love this story that a sermon I preached on one Easter about the, uh, uh, the disciples going and loosening uh, the donkey, you know, so that Jesus could ride in on, on uh, Palm Sunday. He said, that donkey was tied up. It was in a pen. And those two disciples were given the order by God, by the Son of God, Jesus, go and loose this donkey. But he didn't, wasn't loosing this donkey so that the donkey could be set free, so that he could run in the mountains all, you know, doing nothing. You know, and just wandering around in the mountains so that he could be free. He loosed this donkey so that that donkey could fulfill the plan that God had for its life. And that donkey's plan was just a small sliver of the whole plan. Didn't seem like it was a whole lot, did it? But you see, that donkey fulfilled a prophecy when it said that you'll see your king come riding in on a donkey. He went and said, go get me that donkey. That's our lives. God did not set us free from a life of hell and sin so that you and I could just wander off in some space in this world and forget all about him. He set us free from a life of sin and a destiny, an eternity of separation from him so that we can fulfill the plan that he had for each one of us. And he has given us the authority to do it. There's not one of us that's been given a plan that God cannot fulfill the plan in our lives. You cannot miss what God's done for you. You cannot not do it if you are pursuing it. If you're not pursuing it, you're not going to do it. I guess I could probably write a song like that, huh? Let's close over here with Revelations chapter. Revelations chapter 19. I think it's verse 5. No, verse 7 there. Read 7 down through 9. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. We are special people. We are called to be the bride. We are the bride. We have been purposed to be clothed in fine, bright linens. And in fact, if you go on and you read on in that chapter, you'll read that uh, in verse 11, it said, John said, I saw the windows of heaven open. He said, I saw a white horse, and he that sat upon the horse was called faithful and true. And in righteousness did he judge and make war. He said he had a, a crown upon his head, and his eyes were like flame of fire. He said he had a name written that no one knew except for him. He said he had a vesture. His, his vesture was... Uh, uh, a name written, the, the uh, Word of God. He was called the Word of God. And all of the armies in heaven, all the armies in heaven, he's talking about all the saints. He's talking about you and I after the rapture. You and I are purposed to ride with him. It said, clothed in fine white linen. You see, that's what verse five, or 7, 8, and 9 uh, is alluding to. That's the robe that, uh, that we have been given through the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And when he comes back, we will ride with him. 
whatever that looks like. Uh, John was trying to explain it from his world understanding, you know, uh, uh, having no understanding of, uh, of automobiles or, or mechanics uh, of our day. He was explaining it from his day in vision. Can you imagine what that's going to be like in real time when we come back and we are riding with the Lord and he sets his feet down in a final, final plan to restore all that had been stolen and all that had been destroyed by the uh, ugly face of sin. And I like what it says in Revelations 20.10. It said, and the Lord spoke from heaven and cast the devil into the lake of fire where the false prophet and the beast had already been thrown. It's not even going to be a fight. I mean, there's not, God's not going to have a struggle with this. A lot of people think, you know, that Satan is this equal to God. No, he's not. He's not omniness and omnipotent, omnipresent. Our God could take him out just like that with one word, and someday he will. That's not your job, and that's not my job. Your job and my job is to use our authority and our kingly, kingly position of authority, keeping in mind that if we are not walking in the position of worship, then we're not going to be able to use the kingdom authority that God has given us. We're not going to be able to stand against the forces of hell when they come against us and our family. So we are called to worship God with our whole life, declaring ourselves dead and declaring that Christ is living in us. So anything that our flesh wants to do, our flesh does not have the pleasure of just doing it because this body don't belong to us no more. The good news is that God helps us with it. And if we have slipped, God is just and faithful to forgive us. He understands that we are mortals. He, we, the scripture says we don't serve a God who is not uh, familiar with our frailties, who does not know our pain. We serve a God that fully understands it. And when we call out to him, the scriptures tells us that when we're in trouble, that the Lord don't run from us. He runs to us. Let's, uh, let's spend some time here in prayer. There are several unspoken requests that have come to me, uh, and I was asked to have the congregation pray over. We want to continue to pray for a strategy uh, to that, uh, for the body of Christ to take a stand in the community, uh, not just our community, but in the communities, but in this community particular, so that we can take our kingdom authority and we can push back the devil and his attempts to bring a perversion into our schools, into our libraries, into our communities. We need a strategy. We need a God strategy, and we need a committed team who will see this strategy through. And we need, first and foremost, as kings and priests, as, as the priestly position, to go before the throne of God, worship God, and ask Him for a strategy. I open up the altar if anyone wants to come up uh, to the altar and, and pray. And if you got any other prayer requests,